thanks again uh, for tuning in to the Backyard Wildlife. Uh, this is episode four, I Rabbit. Um, and in this series, we're taking a close look at our extremely common, um, in this case, extremely cute and extremely pro prolific neighbors, uh, cottontail rabbit. Um, but before I get started, I'd like Available to folks of all ages uh, at the Urban Ecology Center in your backyard website. I just watched a really nice two minute video from our volunteer program manager, Davida Flower Shanklin, pictured on the right here on the best practices and importance of neighborhood trash pickup in this time, uh, performing that community service. So, for all you volunteers out there, she and all of us can't wait to start working with you again whenever that time may be. I also want to draw your attention to a new nature challenge being launched by the community program department uh, taking place this weekend called Nature with Friends. And they're encouraging everyone to get out to your local green spaces this weekend and to share your discoveries with our community with the hashtag uh, Nature with Friends. You can check out our website for more details on that. I'd also just like to mention how much fun I had during the Backyard Birding Blitz last Saturday mainly because so many people participated and it was really fun interacting with so many fun creative folks, your, your pictures, your comments, your submissions. Uh, they were hilarious, hilarious and heartwarming and beautiful. And for me, it made sitting behind my computer for six hours totally worth it. Um, and all six hours, by the way, are available to watch on YouTube if you wanna go back and hear really bad dad jokes or if you missed the trivia or the craft or the conversations or the appeals for donations. A few of you said tuning into the Facebook live event was like having the PBS fundraising telethon on in the background. Um, but a few highlights from the event uh, that Ethan sent out earlier this week, there were 93 checklists submitted from eight states and five countries uh, comprising 209 species and almost 6,000 individual birds. Uh, that's just incredible. It's so cool that, that collectively that's what we did. Uh, the most common birds were America's Next Top Robin, which was reported on 74 of the 93 checklists. America's Next Top Goldfinch was on 60 checklists, and the Northern Cardinal was on 59 checklists. Um, the, most, the most abundant species on one checklist was the chimney swift, uh, seen here at a very rare angle because 95% of the time you're looking up at them. And one checklist had 70 individuals. Uh, the team name winners were Lord of the Wings for the home challenge and Princess Binoculars for the family challenge. Carlos Chavarria, participating from Heredia Costa Rica, had 55 species. And Marty from Madison had 47 species on his checklist. Um, and quickly, some of the cool birds that were seen during the event. Uh, we had a keelbill toucan and a rufous-capped warbler from Costa Rica. We had this crazy looking Eurasian wryneck from the Czech Republic uh, and a Eurasian magpie from the Federation of Bosnia. Tell me that bird doesn't look like a, a corvid. Um, All right, we had a mountain chickadee from Colorado, scarlet tanager from Massachusetts, summer tanager from Wisconsin, a pileated woodpecker from Michigan, a Swainson's warbler from North Carolina, and then finally one of those birds that begs the question, is that bird for real real, designed by the same people who bring you color by number books, a painted bunting from Texas. So thanks again, everyone who participated in that event. Um, you asked us for more opportunities like this and we're looking into some options right now and any feedback, positive or constructive is super welcome. And again, let us know what the UEC can do for you because I'll tell you, we need you right now. You're good for us and we miss you. All right, on to our featured backyard critter. I've started each episode by looking at the phylogenetic grouping of the organism or where the organism falls in the tree of life based on their evolutionary history. If you watch the first few minutes of both Desperate House Sparrows and Fifty Shades of Gray Squirrel, there's a little more background on this. Uh, the Eastern Cottontail is a mammal, is an animal, excuse me. 
with a backbone, and it is a mammal. So from here, it's it's the same as the gray squirrel. Uh, but then it takes a different ter turn. The, the gray squirrel is a member of the largest order of mammals, the rodents. And a common misconception is that rabbits are also rodents, but they're not. They belong to the order Lagomorpha, which includes rabbits, you see here, and hares, and pikas, uh, all incredibly cute. Uh, lagomorph comes from the Greek lagos, or hair, and morph, or form. So essentially, these are animals that have the form of a hair. So nothing like using a word to describe its definition. What's a hair? Oh, it's an animal that looks like a hair. So now, well, you might be asking, what's the difference between a rabbit and a hair? And I'm here to tell you, but we'll start with the different, with what differentiates lagomorphs rabbits, hares, and pikas from the other animals, uh, particularly their distant relatives, the rodents. So these are all lagomorphs. Rodents are small, cute, and, whoops, oh, the family, sorry, but the family is Leporidae. Um, and so then that distinguishes rabbits and hares, and it, it, um, it's where the pikas take a, take a leave. Okay, so rodents, again, small, cute, and cuddly. Uh, like this extinct bull-sized cousin of the guinea pig that lived two million years ago. It was about five feet tall and about 10 feet long, but it is a, robot, a rodent. And the important distinction is that rodents, even these gigantic ones, have two incisors on top. Lagomorphs, uh, and let's just pretend this is a 50 foot tall rabbit to keep the illusion going. Uh, they have four incisors on top and you can't really tend tell um, unless you have the perspective of a blade of grass about to be eaten. But in this photo you can see two small peg-like incisors that help with mastication of all that plant matter. Which brings us to the second important distinction between rodents and lagomorphs um, and that is that rodents tend to be omnivores eating plants and occasionally animals while most lagomorphs are strict herbivore specialists. Uh, which is where those peg-like chewing incisors really come in handy. Um, the two groups do share the characteristic that their teeth grow continuously throughout their life, uh, necessitating the constant chewing on plant matter to keep those growing teeth in check, otherwise they grow out of control. Uh, and another similarity between the two groups, if you care, is that they have a smooth surface cerebrum, which affects their cognitive information processing speed. So it doesn't necessarily make them dumber, but it would, it just means that they would take a little longer uh, to solve a problem or to take an IQ test compared to other mammals where the, the folds in the cerebrum allow for greater speed of processing information. Within the lagomorph group, it's easy to separate, separate out the pikas. Uh, they're just not the jumpers in the family. They lack most of the hopping adaptations both skeletal and physiological that the rabbit and hares have. Um, and you can see here the size of their ears, the size of their back legs. All, their, all four of their legs are about the same size. Um, but yeah, as you can clearly see here, they do share that cuteness gene with their cousins. Um, and then, okay, so what is the difference between a rabbit and a hare? Uh, they're not super clear cut because there are 32 species of hares and 29 species of rabbits worldwide. Uh, so there are always bound to be exceptions to the rules. But we'll start with size. Hares tend to be larger with correspondingly longer ears and feet. Uh, the next distinction is sociality. Hares are solitary species, um, but some species of rabbits are, are colonial as a general rule. Coat color, they can look pretty similar. You can't usually just tell the difference between a rabbit and a hare about their color, um, but it's hares uh, that will change to a white coat in the winter, it's a familiar snowshoe hare. Uh, they're white in the winter for camouflage and then they turn brown in the summer. And then the final distinction is, and I'm not sure if this is the proper use of the word, I'm just gonna call it precociality. Uh, so precocial animals are born fully developed 
and ready to go like a kill deer right out of the egg it's ready to go out and walk around and, and eat um, altricial animals require parental care to survive so hares are born fully precocial ready to go uh, but rabbit when the, the kits that's the name for the young they're not quite ready they, they're born blind they need some care for mom in the nest for a little while um, and just in case you, you think you now understand these differences between rabbits and hares, just remember one thing, or three things. The rock hare is a rabbit, the jack rabbit is a hare, and the hispid hare is a rabbit. Got it? Okay. Our familiar backyard rabbit is the eastern cottontail. Uh, cottontails fall in the genus Sylvilagus and tend to have stubby tails with a white patch underneath that show predominantly or prominently uh, while they're retreating, which is very similar to the white-tailed deer we're so familiar with. So as they're running away, you see that white tail. Um, our, um, the, it is the most common rabbit in North America, and it has a similar story to the Eastern gray, gray squirrel at this point. Um, it's, it's a little tough to distinguish its native distribution with the many places to which it was introduced. Pre-modern history, rabbits were found mostly in meadows and other shrub, shrubby areas. Uh, in southern Canada and the north, down through Central and Northern South America and up into New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, but like all of the critters that we're highlighting in the series, they tend to do well in urban and suburban habitats and their range expanded quite a bit as humans developed the land and cleared the forest. They're not native to New England, incidentally, but expanded there uh, where they now compete with the native New England cottontail. Um, and those little blips in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, uh, those represent introduced populations that gained a foothold. Um, they've also been introduced to many Caribbean islands and to Northern Italy. Uh, like the squirrels and the house sparrows, eastern cottontails follow Bergman's rule, meaning individuals tend to become larger as you head north, uh, which is related to retaining heat more efficiently in harsh climates. So some of the biggest rabbits with the biggest ears uh, you can find in the north. Um, however, uh, those in the desert, uh, which, are, which doesn't follow Bergman's rule, uh, you'll also notice some really big ears there too. Um, which again has to do with thermoregulation, in this case, the extreme heat. Uh, one habitat requirement, which our backyards tend to provide well, are areas to hide. Um, in wild areas, these would be shrubs or other small dense vegetation or a forest edge, although they don't typically go deep into forests either. Um, they are one of the most preyed on animals in our area. Um, lots of things like to eat them and so they they try not to venture too far out in the open but when they do they usually have a yeah, quick escape route at the ready um, and they'll like make a beeline for a shelter or you'll see them run in a zigzag pattern if they can't make it to shelter in time they are crepuscular meaning they're most active around dawn and dusk and they tend to be more active during rain and fog essentially whenever visibility would limit their predators ability to see them. Rabbits are also extremely territorial and will put up a really good fight against other intruding rabbits and uh, that some of you have witnessed that before. Um, you may have guessed it already, but cottontails breed like rabbits. The mating season lasts anywhere from January through September. Uh, so it's easier to define the non-breeding non-breeding season than it is to define the breeding season. Um, that, that, that depends on local weather conditions too. Uh, their mating system is promiscuous and lots of rabbits are made in any given year. Essentially the strategy is make more rabbits than the predators can take because again a lot of predators take rabbits. Nests are small holes and depressions on the ground uh, covered by grass or other vegetation. And in parks or in our backyards, I know in my lifetime, I've accidentally come across rabbit nests just because uh, 
I either just happen upon them and they're right in the middle of our backyard and I've been near them for a long time. Um, or, you know, unfortunately because a predator gets in and, and, and gets them, but they're very good at hiding even just in lawns, in the middle of lawns. Um, the young rabbits, the kits are born with a, a finer coat of hair and they're blind. Um, and so that it's kind of a, a fairly unique convenient system of having this depression under the grass because then the mother rabbit can just kind of nonchalantly park over that hole where her young are with her body as if she were just like resting or eating. So not drawing attention, but then now the young have access to her milk from underneath. Uh, so she's not really drawing a lot of attention, just, just kind of hanging out in a space. And she'll do that about twice a day uh, to, to feed them. So the developing young are never really truly exposed. Uh, within a week, their eyes open and they go on, on little, little forays from the nest. Uh, and by a month, they're completely weaned and independent. And in two months, they're already ready to reproduce. So yeah, if there's one piece of parenting advice I've heard over and over again, it's enjoy it. Enjoy while it lasts because you blink an eye and they're already grown up and gone. And in the case of rabbits, probably already reproducing. The average female produces three to four broods a year uh, with an average of five kits per brood meaning on average they're producing 15 to 20 young per year. In some areas they can have up to seven broods and some broods can have up to 12 young. So it can get pretty crazy pretty quickly but let's just assume you have an average mother uh, producing four broods of five kits and half of those let's say are female so and let's assume there's no predation, which is extremely unrealistic, but for the sake of argument. So if one female produces 20 kits this year, and then if 10 of her young also produce 20 kits the next year, within that two year, two year period, you went from one rabbit to 220 rabbits. Um, and that number can get close to a thousand on the up end of those scales. So rabbits can have really explosive population growth um, but then the reality shows us that this is controlled uh, by a high mortality rate. And here are some of the ugly statistics related to the downside of being a rabbit. Annual adult survival is estimated at about 20%. So as a rabbit, you have about a one in five chance of make it, making it through any given year. Um, the biggest cause of mortality is predation and parasitism. Uh, there's several times when I, when I've come across a rabbit that uh, is just acting funny, kind of maybe you think it's rabbit, it's going in circles. They do have a lot of parasites and diseases, um, but it's after predation and par parasitism, there's also automobile collisions. Um, and it would probably take me an hour to list all of the predators that eat rabbits as a major portion of their diets, but the major groups are domestic cats and dogs. Um, with outdoor house cats topping out as the biggest threat. It's not, not just the birds um, that your outdoor kitty is feasting on. Uh, then you have wild cats and dogs that also uh, make rabbits a major portion of their diet. And when a rabbit or any type of prey item, uh, if you think back to your ecology classes, uh, when an animal is super common, the predators get pretty good at preying upon them and they have a search image and they know what they're looking for. And since rabbits are such prolific breeders, they tend to always be common. So predators get good at eating them, even, even with the anti-predation uh, kind of adaptations they have. Um, and birds round out the major groups of predators. And with that crow, I've personally twice witnessed American crows predate or attempt to predate on rabbits. Uh, the, first oops, the first instance was on a, a Riverside Park bird walk. Uh, we were up on the tower and we saw a group of about a half dozen crows into a small bush. 
And then the crows just surrounded the bush and there was this long standoff. They couldn't get into the bush where the rabbit was, but they weren't letting that rabbit get anywhere. And we didn't stick around long enough to see how it ended. Um, and the second instance was during a, a bird walk at Washington Park where we witnessed a crow distract a mama rabbit. And when she went off to chase the first crow, a second crow popped out of a nearby tree to grab a kit from her nest and fly away from it. So literally that nest was in the middle of the grass behind the Washington Park fan shell. So crows and rabbits have a long time feud going on, uh, way longer than Bugs Bunny and Elmer. And to witness a result of that long relationship, you see that they even start to look like each other. So my question to you is, is this someone scratching the neck of a crow or is it a rabbit nuzzling its nose into the hand of the petter? This is one question that science has yet to discover an answer to. Okay, so a lot of things like to eat rabbits, but they do have some nice anti-predation mechanisms. Uh, first of all, those, those eyes that are right out in the middle of either side of the head uh, provide an almost 360 degree view just like our, like a woodcock, um, so it can be, it can be very hard to sneak up on a rabbit. And of course, those ears, those big, movable satellite dishes, make it hard to sneak up on a rabbit. And then, those legs, a rabbit, it'll run away with leaps and bounds, sometimes zigzag pattern. So it can also be very hard to chase down the rabbit. And enough rabbits to survive, uh, to start poking around in places that we may not want them. Like, Mr. McGregor's garden. There's a reason why we, why some of us need to put the chicken wire around our garden plants and it's not to keep up the chickens. Uh, but when rabbits, when rabbits aren't eating our vegetables, they're eating grasses, bark, shoots, fruits, buds, flowers, and seeds of many, many, many different kinds of plants. So, as we wrap up, this talk, I just want to remind you that if if you watch the Fifty Shades of Grey Squirrel, I talk a little bit about rabbit tracks versus squirrel tracks, um, and also how it's easy to find evidence of rabbits, particularly in the snow, from their footprints, uh, but also because of their small round poops. So if any of you have a pet rabbit or have kept pet rabbits, um, you know that uh, you know rabbit poop is is pretty harmless. Um, you, you don't really think twice about picking up the little poop pellets with your bare hands. It's, it's pretty much pellets of dried hay. If you have a dog, there's a good chance your dog likes to eat those pellets. Um, and if you have kids, it's probably worth investing a little bit of time to make sure you can tell the difference between the rabbit poop and your Cocoa Pops cereal. And if you have a pet rabbit, you've probably seen them put many hours into grooming themselves licking their entire coat and there's just nothing cuter than watching a rabbit lick its front paws and then move the paws around its eyes or they grab an ear and they just start massaging that ear. Uh, it's just, or when it sticks out that long foot, like it's stretching um, and the rabbit here on the bottom left is really going head first into its own toes. So all of this grooming, um, but when what you may not know is that sometimes they're grooming, you may see them kind of work a little more vigorously around their butt area. And I apologize if, if this takes one of the cuteness layers away, but when they're doing this, they're actually eating their own poop. Um, and this, they're not eating that tidy round cocoa pop dry kind of poop. Uh, most of the food that a rabbit eats goes through the regular digestive pathway which ends up as those nice tidy pellets. Uh, but some of the food is diverted into the cecum, which is a pouch off the small intestine. And there it's mixed with bacteria and yeasts and other microorganisms that are able to convert the cellulose from the plants into sugars. Uh, and that process is called hindgut fermentation. Then this mixture kind of passes through the intestines and when it comes out, the rabbit licks it right up it eats it again uh, because that now that poop contains a lot more added nutrients uh, that the normal digestion process couldn't absorb. 
So again, if you're a rabbit owner, sometimes you'll get a little bit of those cecotropes like left on the floor or a towel. Um, and that objectively is pretty gross. It's kind of sticky and super smelly. Um, so better that the rabbit just eats it and then you don't have to deal with it. But it's it's a pretty you know unique way of, of getting way more nutrients out of a food that can be very hard to digest. Um, it doesn't eat eat. Uh, it's, it's almost tr strictly herbivorous, so it's, it's a little harder to get some of those materials. Hey Tim, we have a question. Sure. Um, so since rabbits are social, do they have an order of dominance? Um, there are warrens that uh, I don't know the answer to that, I would imagine, um, because different species of rabbits have different degrees of sociality. So without knowing the answer to that question, I would guess that yes. Um, the Eastern Cottontail is is way more territorial than other rabbits. And uh, and so they're, they're a little bit more on your own. I'm going to defend my patch of, of territory. So as far as rabbit species go, it's a little less social. And I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know the answer to that question about sociality and other species, but I would imagine and that's an excellent question. Okay. Um, so the only way that I can think of ending a talk on rabbits is to show photos, starting with the domesticated cousins of the wild rabbits. I had a rabbit, Luna, that like she slept like the rabbits on the lower left. And a couple times she really gave me a heart attack because I thought she just had keeled over dead. But for a while as a young rabbit, that's just how she slept. Um, and uh, she moved to that position very quickly. She went from bouncing and bouncing and bouncing to, uh, to feet straight up in the air. I will give a little public service announcement about pets. I don't normally go to this area in these talks, but just because I had a wonderful pet for 12 years, uh, I think rabbits do make great pets. They're just not uh, they do not do as well in cages. So I encourage you, if you are, if you have a rabbit, um, to make sure it gets plenty of free time or even consider getting rid of the cage. They can be potty trained. Um, there's a whole, whole resources on house rabbits. And um, I kid you not, I didn't know anything about rabbits. And, and after I had a pet, this is an animal that when I would walk in the door would come and literally greet me and run around my legs and just was so happy to see me. At night when I'd go to bed, she would snuggle with me. And then in the morning, she'd come back up on the bed and, and lick my nose uh, to, to wake me again. So uh, if you can handle those little, you know, dried pellets and, and the litter box uh, odor, you can, you know, change that pretty, pretty frequently. Uh, I was just blown away by how social, how just like amazing they are as pets. So again, we're taking a little little break from the wildlife side of things, uh, but their their cousins in the wild are equally cute. Um, and I apologize for my uh, use of the word cute liberally today because I just I don't normally go there, but I just can't think of another way to describe this animal. Um, you may have seen wild rabbits or your pet rabbits do that kind of midair kung fu twisty kicky leap. Um, it's considered play, but the thought is that it does prepare them later as a defense mechanism if a predator is about to get it or if it's fighting another rabbit in a territorial dispute. But there is a name for this maneuver and it's called a binky. Um, so with that, we'll wrap up episode four of the Backyard Wildlife Series. Uh, I hope you all take some time to rediscover the sparrows, robins, squirrels, and rabbits in your backyard. Take some time to really watch their, what they're doing and why, what patterns do you start to notice? Uh, because we're going to do, a, uh, we're going to offer a chance to really study the wildlife in your backyard. You don't have to wait for us. You can do it on your own, um, but we're going to do kind of a guided uh, chance to do that. Um, but do be careful. It's a time suck, and this could be a rabbit hole that you may never escape from. So, thanks everyone.